Good morning. Today we are going to talk about some of the most popular tales in Japanese culture. The short stories from the Edo period which celebrate not the courtier's world the way the Heian tales do. You've read the diary of Izumi Shikibu and we will take a look at the tale of Genji later on in the semester, but and not the tales we saw in the tales of Heike, which are called Budo or the Way of the Warrior. Don't worry, I will send a uh, note to you all that has the vocabulary in it. Uh, this is, in fact, um, the uh, the kind of storytelling that became popular in the Edo period, which uh, ran from 1603 to 1868, in other words, until the Meiji Restoration, when uh, Commander Perry opened Japan, or forced Japan to open to uh, foreign contact in a more complete way than had been before. And the people who occupy the central role in these stories are the merchant townsmen. So Budo means the way of the warrior, and Chonindo means the uh, way of the merchant townsman. Yeah, hold on, I have don't worry about the vocabulary. Um, these were tales that were the product of increasing economic prosperity, especially among the merchant classes, and also with the increasing prosperity, increasing literacy. And so there was a market for tales and stories about these people who, for a variety of reasons, could never turn their accumulation of wealth into political power. The classes among the Japanese were far more restricted to their own class than in China, where the examination system of the imperial period always allowed for some students from what would be regarded as the lower classes who were not members of the nobility and who were not even members of the literati class to study, to take the national exams, and then to become officials. So you had social mobility in China during the imperial period that during the feudal periods of Japan was simply not possible. Now, Ihara Saikaku, the author of the book you have, was the first really talented writer to capitalize on the bourgeois tenor of his times. His fiction was not written for the upper classes, although I'm sure they enjoyed it very much, but for the members of the class portrayed. And this set of five tales reflects the author's original conception of the set. Uh, he usually wrote tales as a set, and um, they are unified by a common kind of person or environment. So, for instance, it would be all people from a certain kind of town, or it would be all persons from a certain class. Um, one of the reasons that Saikaku is valued is that he provides a present, very penetrating analysis of this society. Um, it's 
basically a society in which the clever merchant can make a killing. And so these are bourgeois by and large. <laughs> they all have a sting in the tail. These are bourgeois success stories of the self-confident, ingenious trader who lives by his wits. Um, and he is described as the independent man who cares nothing for family or lineage, for it is in gold and silver that he finds his pedigree. In Sai Kaku's view, the ideal merchant was endowed with a quality known as Sai Kaku. It is a pun, the character for this quality, this wit, if you like, or this ability to live by your wits, is actually a different kanji from the one that Sai Kaku used for his name. Um, so you have praised a form of ready wit and ingenuity, which has nothing to do with martial prowess and may initially not have anything to do with your material wealth, but it gives you the ability to attain it. His success stories are often about men who have this desirable quality of saikaku and other desirable qualities which should make them successful in this merchant class. However, and here is the hook, if you push these qualities to extremes, they can get you into trouble. So for instance, when thrift, which is a very admirable quality, is taken to an extreme and becomes miserliness, then it becomes a fault and creates troubles in society. When wit becomes deception and cheating in business, and when appreciation of sensuality goes too far, it creates, well, the kind of problems that you have in this particular set. Um, in fact, what tends to draw this set for, together is that they focus on people who, up to the point of the story, have lived lives totally unaware of sensuality. And when they are swept off their feet, when it hits them, that can lead us into difficulties. Money was the touchstone of the merchant's success, and Saikaku's interest in writing about money was a natural extension of his sympathy with the way of the merchant. The other great theme of these Chonindo stories was love. And again, that's what binds these together. That is called Koshoku. And love is the other side of what is or has come to be known as the floating world. Now, what is the floating world? The word for this is Yukio. For some reason, the rising Tokugawa merchant class did not convert their economic power into means of gaining political power. They directed the strength and social energy they got from their economic advantage into several fields. The first, of course, was the expansion of their business activities and accumulation of even greater wealth. And we know all about that in America, capitalism in its uh, most uh, focused form. There were two other fields that, in which these people invested, and these were primarily fields of diversion, the cultural and the hedonistic, which for the merchant townsmen found common ground in certain areas, especially in the Kabuki theater, on the one hand, and the licensed quarters of prostitutes, which were theoretically off limits.